Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Chris Wright. I'm the project manager for ITM Hull. A very warm welcome to you all. As you gathered, my name is not on there, so I'm not one of the keynote speakers. Uh, just a little bit of business before we begin. Um, everybody has come with bags or got their bags at the hotels already. Um, a green rectangular canvas bag has been left just at the entrance by the box office there. Whoever that belongs to, they need to come and claim that bag, please, before we can continue. I don't want to name and shame anyone to now stand up and walk out. But if, you're, if, you're bag, if you left your bag there, if you could please go and claim it now. Everybody? <laughs> and in the spirit of inclusion, you are very welcome to come back in once you've claimed your bag. <laughs> Thank you for your courage, sir. <laughs> okay, he will make his own way back in. So we'll just begin now. I'm going to hand you over to um, Katie Fuller from Absolutely Cultured. Thank you very much. Not entirely sure if that round of applause was for Chris and his bag announcement or for me, but um, a, a huge uh, hello and welcome, uh, an unseasonably warm welcome, I'm pleased to say, to, to Hull and to IETM Hull 2019 to everybody. Um, and my name's Katie Fuller and I'm the Creative Director and Chief Executive of Absolutely Cultured and we are the local organising partner here in Hull. We're really thrilled to be hosting this IETM plenary meeting in a city which has seen in recent years a, a real upsurge in cultural participation. We've seen growth and development in the work which is being made in this region from both established and emerging artists. We've seen audiences embrace new opportunities and we've seen really exciting new partnerships emerge. After the thrilling roller coaster of a year, which was 2017, when Hull was UK City of Culture and played host to over 2,500 projects and events over 365 days, it's now more important than ever that we and our colleagues in the city and, and beyond maintain that momentum and keep Hull alive as a place which enables and empowers culture and creativity. Your presence here in the city is a really part, vital part of that and the conversations and the networks and the partnerships that are going to come out of it are really important to cementing that reputation of the city. I'd like to give thanks and credit to Hull-based E52 and Leeds-based Walking Talking Project for their initiative and foresight in spearheading the original idea of bringing IETM to Hull as part of the legacy of City of Culture and it's a legacy for Hull, for the north, the wider region and the whole of the UK. It's a long time since IETM has been to, been to the UK and we're delighted that it's back here in Hull. Um, I need to do a whole heap of thank yous now, so please bear with me, but it's really important that we recognise the effort and energy that's gone into making this happen. So a big thank you from us to the team at IETM who have been incredibly supportive and have guided us through this process beautifully. Uh, to the British Council and the Arts Council England who have championed IETM Hull as well as providing funding and support to enable this event to happen. To Hull City Council who got behind this project from the very early days and, and have again provided support and resources and also to Visit Britain. A thank you to Hull Truck for providing us with this amazing space to use as a hub and for also managing the box office for all of the ticketing for the artistic programme which is a no mean feat although of course normal business for Hull Truck. Um, I want to give a huge thanks to our steering group. Um, this has been one of the best examples that I've ever experienced in my working life of working with a steering group. Um, they've supported us, they've guided us, they've advised, they've challenged us. Um, and they've each individually put an enormous amount of legwork in as well to, to making it happen, been really hands-on. So a big thank you to Jessica Farmer and Hannah Bentley from Arts Council England, to Andrew Jones and to Cathy McArdle from the British Council, to Joe Verrant from Unlimited and to John Wilkinson and Amanda Huxtable. And, and another huge thank you to my team at Absolutely Cultured who've worked really tirelessly to turn this around in, uh, I think, maybe a record-breaking amount of time for delivering an IETM plenary. It's been a very short turnaround. Uh, particular thanks to Chris, who you've met, uh, Lindsay Stockley, Sammy Hindmarsh, Lily Meller, Becca Clark, Ben Pugh, Dan Watts, Becca Aspen, Laura Andrew, and the many, many other people who work behind the scenes processing invoices and all of those other less shiny, sexy things. 
I've got a few practical things to tell you about. Um, you've all got your guides, hopefully, which should have uh, all the information you need in. But the other thing to say is that the teams are around, but also our iconic blue-coated volunteers, who you will have met outside. They'll be throughout the city at the different venues that we're using. Um, Hull ITM is, is spread right across the city. It's a really exciting way to get to know the city and to explore it, but those volunteers will be there to help you. Uh, ask them anything. They know the, all of the answers, I can guarantee it. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention to the courtesy code that's in the, um, the guide. This has been developed by the local team and it's designed in the spirit of inclusion to enable the creation of a safe space in which all voices can be heard and an environment in which opposing views can exist without judgment and prejudice. So please have a look at that and familiarise yourself with it. Um, also, the artistic programme, it's cracking. I'm absolutely over the moon with the range, diversity, um, quality of the shows that we've been able to bring here to Hull. We're really, really lucky to have that here, and we're really lucky that that's open for our local audience as well as for you delegates. If you haven't got your tickets yet, the box office is just outside. Uh, tickets for other venues aren't available on the door, so do make sure that you book them up in advance. I think that's the practicalities over with. So it just remains for me to say that I'm really personally hugely excited about the next few days. The theme of inclusion is so rich and vital and we'll be looking at it from so many different angles that I know it's gonna massively enrich my own working practices. Um, the conversation, debate, exchange of ideas, sharing of knowledge, inspirational artistic work will enrich all of our thinking, hopefully. And on top of that, it's an opportunity to remember and celebrate how much more we can do when we talk together and work together. So please make the most of your time here. Please enjoy our beautiful, vibrant, creative city. And it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Stephen Brady, the leader of Hull City Council and one of the most genuine champions of culture I have ever had the good fortune to work with. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Well, on behalf of uh, Hull City Council, I'd like to welcome you all from around the globe uh, to uh, our wonderful city. And um, outside of this theatre, or every theatre in the UK, and every art gallery, or any places of culture, you will find at the moment a uh, division on uh, quite a big subject in the UK. Um, our, our position, finding our position in Europe. However, inside the theatres and the art galleries and cultural establishments, you'll see a sense of purpose. You'll see unity in people enjoying uh, the programmes and the arts and, and, and the rest of it. If only all the um, talk and the energy from what's going on in the UK at the moment was transported into doing things and into, into providing inspiration, um, then wouldn't it be a great place, to, uh, th this country? <laughs> um, we um, started out, uh, when, when we came in, and formed the administration in 2011, uh, the, uh, the, the world and, and, and this country as well was, was in turmoil I with the financial crisis. And Hull City Council faced over 50% of its of funding cuts. And of course at that time, the easy options is to cut the arts and culture. And um, we did exactly the opposite. We actually increased the funding to arts and culture. We, we um, put in for UK City of Culture. They laughed. A lot of the people, they ain't laughing anymore. <laughs> well, hopefully they've had a few laughs at the, at the uh, comedy festivals and all the rest that's gone on. Um, but um, we, um, I'm, and, and we're with our own outsiders, but we came through because we believed in ourselves and one of the things, uh, the main reason why we got that UK City of Culture title was because everybody in the city worked together to that aim and convinced the judges that it was the right place uh, for, to be given that title. Over that period of time since then, we've totally rebuilt the city, city in terms of the cultural offers. The theatres have been refurbished, 
a, a new music venue where it, we had a, a derelict area of the city. We've, uh, we've totally reconstructed the city centre. We're putting it as a place in this world where everybody's buying online, as a, a city centre where people come to enjoy themselves and take part in culture and leisure. Our volunteers have been absolutely fantastic. They're the base of every success that we've had. And every street in this city has had at least one person from that street be become a volunteer. And what a great asset they are to the country. 97% of the people of the city took part in cultural events uh, during that 2017 year. And they are carrying on doing that. We've got much more to do, but... Um, I, um, I think I've said enough, um, <laughs> and politicians always go on too long, <laughs> um, but um, I, I do know we've got a sense of purpose in what we want to do, is um, little talking and plenty of action. So I'd like to um, um, introduce Alsa, um, and um, thank you very much for listening. What an inspiration the city of Hull can be to many cities around the world, I must say. Good afternoon, everybody. For those that don't know me, I'm Ausa Rikarsdóttir, the new Secretary General of IATM. Thank you. And I'm going to start with the thank yous. First of all, lots of thank yous. Thank you, the artistic community of Hull, for inviting us to your city. Thank you, absolutely cultured team, for the very good cooperation in the last months and all the hard work. Thank you, the staff of all the venues in Hull, which are going to be housing our activities in the coming days. Thank you, British Council and Arts Council of England, Visit Britain, City of Hull, for the support for this meeting. And last but not least, thank you, Creative Europe and the Flemish community for enabling IATM to continue its work. And thank you, members, for your continuous support in keeping this network of ours vibrant and relevant. <laughs> Secondly, I want to draw your attention to several brilliant articles on our IATM website, which we have commissioned specially for this meeting in partnership with HowlRound. And the inspiring mapping of North England written by our very own Tim Wheeler, sitting over there for this meeting, also on our website. And thirdly, don't forget to use the hashtag IATMHow on all your social media activities in the coming days. Your contribution matters in spreading the word and work of IATM. So, I am in my 28th day on the job, <laughs> and I am already loving it. Still a lot to learn, and the fabulous IATM team has been entirely patient in answering my sometimes penetrating, sometimes repetitive, sometimes utterly stupid questions, and I thank you, dear team. You know, IATM is now in its 38th year, not day, year, and it is still going strong. We are still relevant, we are still able to discuss, digest, disagree on the hottest topics of our sectors, and we are able to move on. I feel certain that this meeting will be no different, and that I rejoice in the fact that we are able to differ on our understanding and emphasize and focus points 
on this very important topic of inclusion, which we are going to talk about in the coming days. IETM is the perfect place for diverse dissent democracy, as Goran Tomka speaks of democracy in his article that was written for this meeting. Our informality, our closeness, and our friendships allow us to share and differ, stretch our views and minds and senses. And on that note, I realize this is a strange time for you Brits. And we feel it with you. And I could say, all is going to go well, because you already have a deal with Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Iceland. <laughs> but I'm not going to go down that road. <laughs> but I am going to say to you, you will fare well in the end. And you might actually, not in such distant future, fare better. Sometimes nations and peoples have to go through very dark valleys and total confusion to reach a new path. And I speak from experience as an Icelander 11 years ago. We often hear these days that we are living in times of turmoil and un uncertain futures. And I want to challenge that statement a little bit. It implies that this time is more of a turmoil time than other times before. I think we have certainly experienced worse. I think we have certainly been worse off. We have certainly had much less understanding in the world. In my view, the future is clearer than in many previous times. And the only real catastrophe that we are, sorry, I'm having a hard time shifting and holding all these things. The only real catastrophe that we are not facing is that of global warming. And if we don't get our act to together and do something about that, we know the result. There is no uncertainty. We are just basically doomed. I think our times are clearer because the divisions and dirt in society, once hidden, has been coming to the surface. But, and this is important, our reality is clearer than before, and what we have to do is to regain our social contract. We might agree that we have lost it, some might argue that we never had it. And then there are also those that want to digest the meaning of a social contract. So we have a lot to talk about. But coming back to the turmoil and the uncertainties earlier, I think if we don't address that which creates division in society in the first place, we will get nowhere. It is a complex issue. It has very many layers, but in my view, there is one underlying factor which always creates division in society, and that is unequal distribution of wealth. Let's talk and listen in the coming days. And let's listen again. Let's share an exchange. Let's disagree, even argue, with respect. Let's use our strong network and let's enjoy each other's companies in the next four days. Thank you. <laughs> but before I give the mic to our great keynote speaker, I have a little announcement. We are going to have to change the program for time reasons on Saturday. 
Our General Assembly has very many pressing issues to be attended to, and the General Assembly will be from 4 to 6, not 5 to 6. We are going to extend it for one hour. It's going to be a two-hour session with very many important topics to discuss. Therefore, we are going to cancel, as we know it, the talk and listen session, but we're going to do it in a different way. And now I'm going to ask the advisors in the room to stand up. Advisors, please stand up. Please take a good look at them. And the board members that are in the room. And the staff also stand up. Try to see them and recognize them. Because these people are going to maybe be approaching you and they're going to try to approach as many people as possible in the coming days and ask you about the talk and listen question, which is what are the most pressing, hottest topics you think IATM should deal with in our coming meetings and publications? Please feel free to come up to them as well and discuss with them. And this is going to be an experience of how we do the talk and listen session. Lastly, I want to give you her best regards from Anne-Cécile Sibiu Birkeland, our president, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. And on that note, I am very privileged to give the mic to our keynote speaker of the day, Siade Brown. I don't need the mic. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hi. Hi. Oh, I think I control it. Right. Oh, there we go. Hi. <laughs> what did you have to leave at the door in order to show up today? It's a good question. What did I have to leave at the door in order to show up today? Not much. But if you had asked me that question 10 years ago, then my answer would have been everything. So 10 years ago, I was 16 years old. I had just finished my final year of formal education, and it was the only full year that I did in school. So I went to a pupil referral unit, which is where they send young people who are um, unteachable. <laughs> I, up until that point, had been kicked out of two secondary schools. And so I went into my final year hungry and driven to get my GCSEs and to get out of the door as quickly as I could because I really didn't enjoy school, but I knew that I should probably have something under my belt. After a year, I left with 11 GCSEs A star to C, and I was the most awarded young person to ever have gone through that pupil referral unit proven that you can just study for a test to get an education in the UK. <laughs> I left, and I was, I was psyched, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to study, I'm going to be a psychologist, I'm going to change the world, I'm going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I did um, about three months in college and realized quite quickly that I do not like to be taught in that way. I like to learn by doing. And so... At the same time, I was working, so I was doing full-time college. I was working full-time in a sweet shop. I was living independently, so I'd actually left home when I was 14. And at this point, I'd moved into the youth homeless, um, youth hostel systems in, in London. And I had also started to club promote in the evenings with my friends because it was fun and I liked clubbing. And I was like, okay, I need to, you can stay, mama. You, okay, all right. I have a 10-month-old baby. I get it. <laughs> uh, so at that point, I was like, I, I want to do something. I don't, I don't want to stay in education. I don't like being taught at. I want to do. And I went to a youth service called Connections, which doesn't exist anymore, but um, we should bring it back because it was one of the most important parts of my youth. And I spoke to an advisor there, and she said, look, it sounds like you probably just want to set up your own business or do something. It sounds like you don't want to work for someone. It sounds like you just want to do your own thing. And I was like, yeah, you totally get me. <laughs> and um, she was like, okay, cool. Um, if you don't want to go to university, then what you should probably do is get a job as a receptionist in 
any type of organization and just get some business skills, just understand how a business works. And I was like, yep, that sounds great. And it's probably one of the best bits of advice I'd ever been given because everybody else was telling me to go to university and I just knew it wasn't going to work for me and I didn't want to waste the money. So I applied for three jobs. One was a receptionist in a gym. One was um, an assistant in a law firm. Ha <laughs> ha, the arrogance of a 16 year old. And uh, the third was um, a business community arts apprenticeship at a theater called the Bush Theater in West London, which was 10 minutes from my house where I grew up. I'd never heard of theater before. I was so not interested that it was a theater that I didn't even, I didn't even research it. I didn't, I didn't, I just saw business in the title and thought, oh, that's a shortcut, great. So I could get an entry level job with business in the title and then set up a company. <laughs> <laughs> And I went to the interview and had an amazing time and a really good chat with the two directors. And that's how I saw it. It was just a chat. And um, I spoke with the two directors and, you know, I was, they said, you know, what do you love about theatre? And I was like, mm, you know, I don't actually really like theatre. But I like watching films and I really like music and I really like magazines. So I feel like, you know, it's kind of, yeah, I'm like, I get it. I get what you guys do. <laughs> and um, they were like, okay, cute. Um, <laughs> And they were like, well, I tell you what, we, do, we really like you, but why don't you go and see a play? And um, <laughs> depending how that goes, come back for a second interview and we'll happily see you again. So I was like, cool. And I left and um, I went to see a play at the Bush and I, my tickets were booked. It was for a Saturday matinee of The Whiskey Taster by James Graham. And... I remember going to the theatre, so it started at 2.30, so obviously I was late, because who turns up early to the cinema? There's the trailers. So <laughs> I got there and it was late, and this is the old bush, by the way, so this is the uh, black box theatre above a pu the O'Neill's pub in Shepherd's Bush, and I knew the O'Neill's really well, I didn't know the theatre, so it took me ages, like, walking up and down, being like, where is this place? And going into the pub and asking the bartender and him showing me a secret door, and, and anyway, it was really hard to find. I got in, and the front of house, uh, the duty manager was there, and she was very cross, and they'd held the house for me because they knew that I was coming because I had an interview, and she was really angry, and she kind of rushed me up the stairs. And at this point, um, I didn't quite look like this, so I was wearing uh, knee-high Timberland boots. I had a massive um, jumper on, which had some kind of slogan that was called to a 16-year-old. I had uh, a big fur coat, and I had massive earrings and headphones in. And I looked around me, and I saw every single person there was white, every single person there had gray hair, and everyone, you know, Saturday matinee, um, and everyone looked at me. And obviously, being the last person, I went up the stairs, um, ran in, a bit annoyed that I couldn't go to the toilet first, ran in, and um, had to walk across the stage to get to like the only seat available, which was in between two grannies. And it was just so awkward. And I remember sitting down and like taking my fur coat off and just being like, oh, I just don't want to be here. And looking around and seeing everyone staring at me like I was so different and I shouldn't have been there. And, um, and I was like, do you know what? I'm just going to go. And I was about to get up and then the lights went off and it went dark. And it's that really awkward moment when I just to sit back down again. Um, and the play started, and 100% I got transported to a whole new world. It just completely, it rocked me. Like, I was transfixed. I couldn't believe what was happening. This, this thing in front of me, it was alive. It, there wasn't a screen. It wasn't like a film. It was, it was alive. These were people. They were talking, and I could understand them. It wasn't Shakespeare language. I could understand them. And... Um, and, you know, and, and it, it was, uh, like, if you know James Graham's writing, like, he is, uh, he's a master, he's amazing. But the way he writes dialogue, it's like, you know, you're sat in someone's, in an office, like, you're listening to people talking, and you know them, and they know you. And I felt invited, and I felt included, and I felt um, this fire burn in my belly, and I was like, I want this, I want to taste this, I want to be part of this. And, um, and I remember being shocked that they had sex on stage. I was like, oh my gosh, are they actually having sex right now? This is too awkward. <laughs> and, um, and I remember them smoking cigarettes and being like, what? We've just had the, um, the ban. You can't smoke inside. Is that real? And um, I remember smelling her perfume as she walked past me. And I just remember feeling like a part of this world. And, and I remember 
realizing just in that moment that I, I could write too, that like anyone could write. Writing wasn't reserved for dead people or for men. Um, <laughs> And it was a real like penny drop moment because until that point, I like I said, I didn't go to school, so I didn't do the school trips to the theatre. I didn't, you know, it wasn't part of my family culture. Um, it just wasn't a thing that I did, and so I, I just it was like, oh, this is cool. It's like Narnia. This is amazing. So the next uh, next day or week after, whatever, I went to the second interview and I just I just gushed at them and was like, this is it. I mean, obviously you're going to hire me, but anyway, I'll talk about the play. <laughs> And, um, and I, I really went to town, and I told them things they could adapt. I told them things that didn't quite work. I told them things that really did work. I, did, I didn't realise <laughs> that that wasn't what you were meant to do. Um, but, you know, I was like, well, you know, this is great. I mean, here's my opinion. And, um, you know, and they, it was a really good chat. And they said to me, OK, so what, why do you want to work here? Other than the fact you really fall in love with theatre, is there anything else that's compelled you to this role? And I thought about it. And I said, well, yeah, actually, like, as a young person growing up in Shepherd's Bush, I've never heard of you. And I have so many friends that would feel exactly like I did coming into this space, but this doesn't feel like a place for us. And given that this is a community apprenticeship role, I could go out and find those people and get them into the theatre. And I didn't realise that I was designing this, like, you know, incredible community engagement strategy. They'd been sat there being like, how do we do this? Um, I just decided, it just makes sense. Hire me and I'll do it. And so I got the job. And that's what I did. I spent a year as the apprentice, and the easiest part of my role was exactly that. It was just going out and telling people, I've fallen in love. Come and see this thing, you know. And, and I remember, like, printing tickets off and going into the market and speaking to people and just saying, look, if you don't come, I'll get fired. <laughs> and, like, you know. <laughs> and... Um, it was, just, it, was, it was absolutely incredible, and I had so much freedom and license, and they were just so impressed with me and were just so eager to hear my thoughts, and I was included in so many different types of conversations. Um, it was absolutely incredible. The hardest bit about my job was having to leave a bit of myself at the door every day. And the longer I worked there, the more of myself I left at the door because I realized quite quickly what success looked like. And it didn't look like me. It didn't sound like me. And so walking into an environment where almost every single person in that organization held not only a, a degree, but a really good degree from like Oxford or Cambridge, or you know, they'd like read the entire works of Shakespeare. They could read Guardian interviews without having to Google the words. They were so clever and so put together and articulate and confident and strong, and that I just wasn't any of those things. And so I made the choice to, unconsciously at the time, but I made the choice to assimilate and to leave parts of me behind at the door. And that started from things like walking in, listening to Bashman on my headphones, which is Caribbean music. It's very sexual. And I would turn it down slowly as I walked through the door because I didn't want them to hear that or I would eat my chicken and chips outside in the park because I didn't want them to see that I could only afford 1.99 chicken and chips from Uxbridge Road for my lunch while they ate avocado salads. <laughs> and it was these kind of slow things that happened, and then there were like bigger things. And I remember being asked to um, make coffee for a, a, a programming meeting, and I went into the kitchen and I opened the cupboard and there wasn't any coffee there. So I went back in and said, oh, I'm just going to pop over to Greg's and get some. And the artistic director was like, what? No, wait, look, come on, I'll come with you. I'll show you where the coffee is. And she came in and opened the fridge. And I was like, why did you put coffee in the fridge? And she brought out, like, ground coffee and a cafetiere and was like, look, you pour it in, you did what? And I was, like, mind was blown. Because to me, coffee was instant. And it just, it, we didn't have... <laughs> um, coffee was instant. And I remember just, it was all of those kind of mini moments that added up and made me feel so inadequate and so unable to be me that the only thing I could do was to be, was to borrow and was to look around me and be like, well, I'll take a bit of this and I'll take a bit of that. And slowly I became a different version of me. After a year and a half of working at the bush and during that time, it, I mean, honestly, it was absolutely incredible. And we moved the theatre into the old library in Shepherd's Bush, where it is now, and artistic directors switched over, so I got to work on some incredible productions, and 
I became the assistant producer, I got put in charge of the community engagement programme, I got to rebrand it and reshape it, and I was given so much agency, and, um, and I was invited to give my opinion, and, and I was kind of, I was seen as the voice of the community, which is actually quite damaging for an individual, but I'll come on to that in a second. So I had all this time feeling really empowered, and I met the chief exec of the Lyric Hammersmith Theatre, which was just 10 minutes down the road. And she offered me a new job to go and work for her. At this point, I was 18. And she offered me the job of, uh, to be a producer in her theatre because she saw an opportunity. The Lyric at the time had, and still has, an incredible young people's programme and an incredible main house programme. And there was nothing in the middle bridging the two together. So Jessica wanted me to come in and create a new program that did that. It bridged the gap. It diversified the type of young people and emerging artists going into the industry because she could see that there was a problem. And she could also see that because of my background and my experiences, I could somehow find a way to not only find the types of people who were diverse that, to get into the industry, but also create interventions and programs that supported them um, to professionally develop. I mean, come on, I was 18. <laughs> and at the time, I was like, is she mad? Like, who is this person? Is she mad? Who would give that to an 18-year-old? And so my imposter syndrome was flaring up. I mean, if it hadn't been over the last year and a half, in that moment, it was like alarm bells ringing in my head, like, this is crazy, you can't do this, who do you think you are? And I remember being so sure that they were going to take the job offer away that when the contract came in the post, I signed it, and then I ran out on my break from the bush to the lyric to hand it in person, just in case they said that they'd lost it in the post or they'd somehow taken it back because I took too long. So that's what, how I was feeling. And... Um, a week before I was leaving the bush, there were drinks, and a few people from the Lyric came over f um, to have drinks, and I was really excited, because I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to meet my new team, and, you know, it's, it's going to be great, and I'm going to make new friends. And I went over to join the conversation, and one of the, one of the girls was saying, have you heard that the Lyric has hired a young person and made them a producer? Whew. And... Um, and then everyone in the circle was like, what? That's ridiculous. And they just started slating this young person who had been given this position. And I literally felt like the world could have, well, the ground could have opened up and just swallowed me right there and then. And it really reminded me that I can try as hard as I want to be like them, but I never would be. And just in that moment, it was a real sharp reminder of who I was and how inadequate I was in to do this job. And so I, that was the feeling I had on my first day of joining the Lyric, and it's something I carried for a good year and a half after starting that position. I'm going to leave it there and zoom out of my personal journey and look at the kind of wider picture of diversity and why it is so important. So I can imagine there are, I mean, I know there are, almost everybody in this room is doing something on the spectrum, and almost everybody in this room has an opinion about diversity and why it's important, but I thought it would be helpful to just highlight some of the benefits to why, why diversity matters. So obviously there's an economic case for diversity, which I think often people forget. Like, so companies who are more culturally and ethnically diverse we're 33% more likely to make better profits. So think about your turnover for last year, add 33% on top of it. This one I found particularly interesting. So this was on Forbes. So a team who, a diverse team are 87% more likely to make better decisions. And you can see it goes up the scale. So if you're looking at gender diversity, that's 73%. But if you're looking at age and gender diversity, that's 80%. And then if you're going to throw in geographic diversity, that brings it up to 87%. I mean, that is genuine proof that the more types of people you have working with you, around you, the better you're going to be and you're going to make more profits. And then this one... Um, just makes a lot of sense. 
if you have a diverse group of people trying to tackle a problem, then they're going to have creative conflict because they're going to come at it from loads of different angles and shapes and sizes, and, but that conflict is going to lead to innovation, which leads to profit, if you care about that. The social case, which I think is more my audience today. <laughs> um, so you, uh, this was touched on earlier in terms of the division of wealth or the distribution of wealth in this country. And this statistic, like I come back to it every single year because it is just so shocking to me. Um, but despite only 7% of the UK population go into private school, they make up 32% of our MPs, 51% of our doctors, 54% of our FTSE 100 CEOs, and 70% of our judges. I wonder what that would look like if we applied it to the cultural sector. Is this because only privately educated individuals are able to do these roles? Or is it because only they are given the opportunity? So the Warwick Commission feels really old now, but I remember at the time when it came out, it was, um, it was really good. <laughs> it was a really good read. And this was one of the quotes that really stuck with me in terms of having access to a cultural and creative education is an absolute, it's an essential way of life. And it hit me because I thought about my childhood and the things that I had access to and realized how much I had been denied, the opportunities I had been denied, and how different my life would have been if I'd had access to arts interventions and whether that would have helped me to stay in school, whether it would have helped me to stay in my house, and whether it would have helped me to go to university. And then finally, this was a quote that was above my desk for a good couple of years. Um, for me, the biggest social case for diversity is that audiences should look like taxpayers. And then there's the common sense case, which is my favorite. So, you know, Oh, ah. um, it just makes sense if you have a group of, if you have a homogenous group of people who all look the same, sound the same, and have similar life experiences, they're going to approach problems with a similar lens. It just makes sense. So once you add diversity into the mix, if you bring different types of people, they're going to have a, a much broader pool and richer understanding of the world and the way they see the world. And through that, you'll have more innovation, better artistic outputs, and more profit. So when I talk about diversity, for me, I'm talking about walk of life. I'm not talking about switching one homogenous group with another. I'm talking about genuine opportunity for people who come from different places who have experienced different things, who experience the world in different ways. For me, that's what diversity means. A few years ago, oh, a few years ago I founded a company called Sour Lemons. And our mandate was to address the lack of diversity in the creative and cultural sectors. So at the heart, that's me. Um, <laughs> at the heart, as if you can tell. Um, at the heart of Sour Lemons is the belief that any disadvantage in life can be your biggest advantage. So your biggest sour lemon can become lemonade. And this is an ethos I have carried with me for a very, very long time. And it's something that my mum used to say to me as a little girl. It's something that I guess at the, like I said, for a big chunk of my career, I thought that the things that made me diverse I needed to strip them away and leave them at the door in order to not embarrass other people or make other people feel uncomfortable with me being there. I needed to be a bit more like other people in order to fit in. But by doing that, I wasn't only denying myself, but I was denying them. And I was denying the organizations I was working for. I was denying them the innovation and richness that comes with having different types of life experiences, particularly when you've been served sour lemons. So our model um, is really simple. So we deliver leadership programs for young adults who have faced a sour lemon or two in life. 
and they want to get into the creative and cultural industries and are finding barriers because of those sour lemons. When I set it up, it was with the belief that the impact I've been able to make over my career, the qualities that make me a strong leader, don't come from textbooks, they come from my life experiences. So my resilience comes from the fact that I've moved around to 16 different houses. My resourcefulness comes from the fact that I left home when I was 14. My charisma comes from being a young carer and having to negotiate and speak to lots of different types of people and adults and know, knowing how to adapt myself to different audiences. And these are all things that you can't learn in a textbook. And so my belief is that young people or anybody who has experienced some kind of sour lemon in life, if they can flip it and see it as their biggest advantage, it becomes a superpower. And our programs, the, the, I at the time was working um, at a big cultural centre in, in London called the Barbican Centre. And the higher up I got, the less people like me I saw. And I was often a minority in every sense of the word. And I was often the poster girl for all things diversity. And it really bothered me because on the one hand, I was saying, like, have I become palatable? Like, am I like the go-to person to speak on all issues of diversity because I make the people feel comfortable about this? Or have I taken up so much space that other people can't come in? What's the problem? So when I set up Sour Lemons, it was with the belief that, okay, cool, I get to sit around these decision-making tables. Why can't they? What is so special about me? I don't want my story to be unique. It shouldn't be, but it is. And so when I set up Sour Lemons, it was with the hypothesis, if I gave young adults who came from similar backgrounds to mine access to the same skills and knowledge and experiences that enabled me to succeed, could they also go on and smash barriers for other types of, uh, for other young people? Could they forge their own opportunities? Yes, they can. <laughs> so our pilot was was so, so, so successful. We had over 20 partners who contributed towards it. We had 12 young leaders. They went on an incredible journey of understanding the power of their life experiences, how they could use that to create change, how they can create artistic experiences, how they can process the things that they've been through, the life experiences they share with their communities, how they could use creativity and artistic outputs to share that and to demonstrate it to the world. 100% of them have now gone on to employment, training, or um, setting up their own enterprises. They're literally smashing life. It is amazing. But they said to me, when they were with me in Sour Lemons, they had, it felt like they were in a bubble. And it was so amazing. And they realized how brilliant they are, how easy it is to get into the industry once you know which doors to push or who to speak to or how to ask someone for a coffee. Those things become really easy. But now that they've left, they still see the same barriers. The barriers are still there that prevented them from getting in in the first place. The difference is now they can just see them more. They can articulate them better and they can really see the injustices that they face. So I responded to that by developing a consultancy arm we now go out and deliver training and advise organizations on how to find young people who are diverse, how to measure the impact of programs and interventions that are set up to address diversity, how to be more inclusive. And my young leaders, my lemons, they get paid to go and do that. When I was thinking through the consultancy model, it just made sense to me. These are people who have been historically excluded from these kind of conversations. I have organizations screaming out to me to come in and solve their challenges around diversity. And my ethos is that it shouldn't just be me sat at the decision making table. So when I put the three things together, it was like, great, you can pay, I will train up my young leaders, you can pay them and they'll come in and they'll support you on that journey, but we won't do it for you. This is one of my young leaders, Marissa, and I promise I could not have paid her to say this quote better. <laughs> when she sent it, I was like, yes.
But it is, it is absolutely true. So sour lemons is important because it is led by someone who distinctly understands the struggle of young people who come from backgrounds that don't have equal access to opportunities that can help them, that can, that can lead them into fulfilling highly paid creative roles. This is the same young leader who said to me a few weeks ago that until she'd met me, she didn't know that a woman of color could be a mentor. That is crazy. She was 23 when I met her, and in all her 23 years, she had never seen a woman of color in a position of power, a woman of color who mentored her. She hadn't seen it. But not only by seeing me did, did it benefit her in many ways, it helped her to know that she could also be a mentor too, and she's now mentoring other young women and showing them that she can absolutely do that. And that is the ripple effect of of diversity, of inclusion, of empowerment. That's the ripple effect. It's not about saying, oh, I've got here, I'm at the decision-making table, I'm gonna close the door now. It's about opening up and broadening it and sharing it and being role models and, and being advocates. But like I said, you can't just focus on the individual making lemonade, it's not fair. You're putting all of the onus on one person. You're saying, do you know what? Yes, life has been hard. Yes, you've had sour lemons, but do you know what? It's okay. Just do this and this and this and then you'll be fine and off you go. But all that does is it denies, it takes away the accountability of the people in power. It says to them that it's okay to be exactly how you are if you're diverse and you need to fit into this system. And it doesn't work like that. I came across this quote recently, when, uh, actually when I, was re um, when I was preparing for this talk, and it just, it made my heart sing. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And that's exactly it. Being more diverse is actually quite easy. Applying a quota and ticking a box is really easy. It's not that hard because there's a whole talent pool of diverse people up there to pick from. The harder bit it's keeping that talent, it's enabling it to thrive, it's creating inclusive cultures and workspaces that allow people to show up every day as they are and not leave bits of themselves at the door when they walk, walk into the building. That's the hard bit. So, the ground could have opened up when that person said to me, oh my gosh, the Lyric has hired a young person, what are they doing, Jessica's gone mad. But it didn't. And I went and did the job at the Lyric, and I went knowing that everyone there, well, this is what I felt anyway, everyone there didn't want me to be there. Everyone there felt that I was a fraud and that I didn't deserve to have that job. So I chose to work harder than anyone else. I was in earlier, I left later, I designed a program that won awards, I then went and fundraised for it, I focused on external partnerships, I increased the diversity of young people by 50%. In my first year as an 18-year-old, I designed a program that reached 800 emerging artists. 50% of them were being me and 51% of them were female. That's incredible. That's what happens when you put someone in a position of power and give them agency and autonomy. It's also what happens when they feel like everyone else around them hates them. <laughs> and I just put my head down and got on with it. So a year into my role, and the theatre decided to apply quotas to the main house productions. I was also the assistant producer on all of the main house shows. At the time, quotas were quite new. I didn't really know how I felt about them, but I knew I didn't really like them. I couldn't quite articulate it. I didn't have the confidence to speak about it then. We were producing a show, and I, was, I would cast the young ensemble. And um, the principal actors who we got for the, for the show were all white and able-bodied. So I was then asked to make sure that m the ensemble was diverse, i.e. primarily being me. And, um, and I kicked back and was like, no, that doesn't seem fair. Like, you're asking me to compromise. Well, you're asking me to put diversity and talent and 
make them compete. Like, that's not fair. Surely we want the best people for the role. But I was pushed back and said, you just have to do this. So I decided to make it my mission to go out and find the most talented young people of colour to be in the ensemble. I reached out to partners who worked specifically with young performers who were diverse. I did outreach. I, I did everything I could. I worked evenings and weekends. I spoke to friends. I texted people. I did everything I could. And I ended up finding a group of incredibly talented young performers to join the ensemble, and they happened to be black. And that bit felt really important to me, that they just happened to be black, that it had nothing to do with their talent, it had nothing to do with the reason why they were on stage, they just happened to be black. I didn't know why, or, or Indian or people of colour. I, I, I didn't know why it felt important at the time. Like I said, I was 18, 19. I just knew it did. And um, so I got them on board. And like I said, that's the diversity bit, so I invited them to the dance. But then I sat down with each and every one of them and worked out who they were as human beings. Not just as performers, not just as people in the company, but who they were. Like, what did it take for them to show up every day? How much harder is it for them to get out of bed? How much harder is it for them to walk into that rehearsal room? And what do I need to do to remove those barriers? And I found out things like one of the girls was a size double G bra and couldn't, she couldn't um, breast and she couldn't afford to buy a new bra. So I went to the costume department and we bought her a new bra. One of my guys was heavily in rent arrears and was about to be evicted from his house and homeless. And he'd just been ignoring these letters and putting them in, in, in his um, drawer. And I knew exactly what that felt like. So I wrote a letter for him and it ended up going to court and representing him and getting his, um, his house extended and putting in place a payment plan. Another young person was so far in her overdraft that if we paid her all of the money at once, she wouldn't, have any, she wouldn't be able to eat because they'd stop her overdraft and then she'd be broke. So we found alternative ways to pay her. I showed up for every single one of those young people because I understood exactly what it felt like to walk into a building every day and not be able to fully be there. That, for me, is inclusion. That's the second bit. It's making sure that there is nothing stopping them from being talented performers, and that's it. But that's the bit I think most people find really hard because it feels uncomfortable. Because once you start looking at somebody else and you start saying, what does it take for you to show up every day? You start to put that mirror back on yourself and you realize what it takes for you to show up every day. But that's the good bit. I think inclusion and diversity work should feel uncomfortable because if it was comfortable, we'd be doing it already. Or we'd be doing it well. <laughs> so those young people also at the time couldn't afford to do a 10-week um, engagement. So it was a four-week rehearsal and then a six-week run. And when I joined the venue, they were paid expenses, like £10 a day, which I don't think you could do now, but at the time, that's what, that's what it was. And I went to the chief at second and said, I couldn't do that. Like, if, if you wanted me to be in this show, I wouldn't be able to afford to be here for free. So we need to pay them. And she was like, I agree, but we don't have the money. So if you can go out and get the money, then I'm happy to pay them. I was like, okay, cool. And I went out and I got the money and I made sure that they got paid. And that was another thing that, again, thinking of inclusion, if money's never been a barrier for you, then you're not trained to think of it in that way. You just assume everybody can show up and that it's fine to be there. Um, so yeah, so like I, just to, just to close, because I'm keen to have questions. We can't just focus on the individual making lemonade, we really can't. And so many schemes and diversity interventions that are out there do. They focus on the individual and they say, it's okay if you're being me, we'll give you a bursary to show up. It's okay if this is a thing that you have, 
we'll do a tiny thing to remove it, but we won't adapt anything else. We won't think about the systems that we've put in place that benefit people who look like us. We won't think about all the other things surrounding you, or all the other things that we might be responsible for. We'll just do that little bit, and we'll feel really good about it. This bit's a really big one for me. Um, on stage diversity is a temporary plaster. <laughs> it really is. It doesn't address any of the root issues that underlie why we don't have diversity on stage. And I'm so proud and excited and happy to see the amount of on stage and on screen diversity that's shot up in the last couple of years. It is so important. I'm not standing here saying that that shouldn't happen. But what I am saying is that until we diversify the types of people behind the scenes, making the decisions, writing, directing, producing, designing, it's never going to be authentically true. I have a friend who wrote a play called Lungs, which, was a, it, which is a beautiful play. It's a two-hander. And it's based on a couple who are middle class and educated and deciding to have a baby and the impact that might have on the planet. A couple of years ago, I was speaking to him and we worked out that that play had had a roughly about 30 productions around the world at that stage. It was amazing, he's amazing. Not one of those, well, sorry, only one of those plays, which was the play that he was directly involved in, cast a person of colour in either of those two roles. However, he himself is married to a woman of colour, and that play was partially written on his own experiences. I find that quite disturbing. And what it tells, what it tells us is that we all, the lens that we're seeing the world through is the lens that makes the most sense to us. So if we have people behind the scenes producing, directing, designing, in charge of casting, and their default, their normal, because it's what they see in their world, is a white middle class couple, then that's what's going to get presented on stage, of course. That's not the problem. But if we have different types of people sat around there, then that norm gets wider. The final thought I want to leave you with today is that when you're thinking about inclusion, it's the holistic picture. It's not just one thing. You can't just solve it with like one bit. It's about looking at a person, at the challenge, and thinking, like, what are all the things that knock onto this? So everything from language to onboarding staff to governance and decision-making to how you write your contracts to inclusion, how you show up for people, accessibility, the biases and privileges that exist within the current culture. And just on that note, I don't think there's absolutely nothing wrong with having a privilege. I feel really privileged because of my life experiences. It's a different type of privilege, but I do feel privileged. Oh, poor baby. I am, um, it's like my mummy senses going. <laughs> I do, um, I, feel, I do, I feel privileged. And if you have privilege, you have power. Like you can use it to create change. You can use it to look around at decision making tables. You can look at it. You can use it when you're casting a show, when you're working with a company, when you're fighting for the rights of someone who is the underdog, who is underrepresented. That's what your privilege gives you. It gives you power. So use it. We can't change like, who we are, we can't apologise for the lives that we've lived, we can't change the world that we were born into, but we can definitely impact the future. And I 100% believe that if we're looking at everything we do with a lens that is inclusive, with a lens that starts with the question, what did I have to leave at the door in order to show up today, I guarantee we're going to start seeing movement. Thank you.
thank you. It's very hot up here. Can I, I'm going to get some water before I do questions. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? No? Comments? Feelings? Thoughts? How did you overcome the barrier between um, the people from the Lyric being very judgmental, you joining their group and then facing them? Obviously, you said you worked harder than everyone else, mm. but I assume at the end of it, you were probably friends um, ish. <laughs> <laughs> Friendly. Yeah, I, that's a good question. So I realized that it wasn't everyone who felt like that, and that I, there were champions there. And that, that's actually a really important point that I missed out from my talk. Um, you, part of that power that I said that you have, you can be a champion for someone just by showing up for them. And that's what, in every organization I've ever had, like the power of mentorship, the power of having someone who is cheerleading you, who is coaching you, who is telling you, like, you can do this. That's what changed the game for me. Um, I... I'd say the majority of the staff there were actually really happy for me to be there. There was a few people who weren't. It is life. But I, um, I worked really hard to include them, funnily enough, in what I was doing and to learn from their expertise and to, you know, to recognize that, yeah, I mean, I was an 18-year-old. I didn't know everything. <laughs> um, what could I learn from them? And by doing that, what could they learn from me? Oh, yeah, hi. <laughs> I can hear you. Oh, my voice won't go. I think we need... Oh, yeah, we need it for the... Input. Thank you, by the way. I hope I wasn't talking too fast. <laughs> ah, teamwork. Love it. Um, my name's Will from Australia. Thank you very much for that um, talk. Um, touches on a lot of what I work in in what I do I work with the blind community in Australia and I was wondering what your take uh, is on allyship and what makes a good ally and and how you try to be a good ally when you're working with people who you don't necessarily share the same life experience which gives you that mm. insight and and empathy um, to reach out and and do a really great job of catering for people's needs yeah that's a great question um Honestly, an ally is just showing up for someone. It really is. And it, it's, it's so much harder than it sounds. Like, it's, I make it sound easy. It's not. Like, to be... It's to, it's to call things out. It's to call out injustice. It's to, it's to know that... It's to recognise that there are things that we all benefit from that oppress others. There are systems that I benefit from that oppress others. And it's understanding that and recognizing it and sitting with it and then using that knowledge to show up for someone else and to, and to support them and to listen to them and to not throw judgment. To not th There's a really classic thing that people often do when you share your experiences because it, it, like, you know, it's your truth. We all have our own versions. It's our truth. But often what people might do when you share your truth is go, oh, yeah, 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 but... And like, just stop that, that bit. Like, just allow that person to have their truth. Just allow them to share it. Even if it isn't what, you can un like, what you've experienced, what you can understand. Just by giving them that space. Because often, if you are a minority, you, you're not often given space. So, allowing, so using your position of power to allow other people to take up space is what I think is a real ally. <coughs> Thanks. How are we doing for time? Are you all right? Someone over here. Hi. I think, oh, they're passing the mic to someone. I don't know who. Oh, it's you. It is you. Okay. Hi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just wondering, in the face of the social disparity growing in this country particularly, mm. how is this different than, let's say, Sir Sugar Allen being the poster boy of the Thatcherism? Is there uh, a difference in terms of making examples which is politically correct and satisfying for a particular audience than actual implementation of change for the people that you work with? 
not sure I understand that. Could you reframe it, please? I, I just mean that uh, maybe also for uh, people not familiar with the UK context. So there has been this thing that, that there is this kid coming from the hood suddenly becomes yeah. such big star, such successful so businessman, and uh, he becomes the of, yeah. th the force of running the machine, which actually is dependent on underprivileged people. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, mm. is, do you feel a difference in the position mm. that you are in and you're presenting yeah. than that? And if so, what is the difference? And how right. actually those uh, connected to such programs yeah. and included in this diversity programs and inclusions yeah. are benefiting from this? And what real impact does it have in their actual life? Okay, wicked. No, I, I get that, thank you. So, yes, I'm so different to Alan Sugar. Um, I, I honestly think one of the main differences is what I was saying before about, like, you know, climbing the ladder and, like, not kicking people down behind you and being, you know, and extending it. Um, I think the consultancy model in Sour Lemons is the, th the thing that makes the difference, in all honesty. It's given agency to my young leaders. It's valuing them for their time and, and paying them. And it's putting them in positions of power. Because you could argue and say, well, they're young people, so you're not exactly addressing leadership. But young people can be leaders, as, as I've demonstrated. And by putting them in those positions, they're not prohibited by like, oh, well, all these things happened 10 years ago. They're seeing the world as it is now, and they're seeing all of these inequalities that they're facing right now, and they're put in positions to change it. I've put two of them on my board of trustees, and I've hired another one of them to run the second program this year. It's things like that, like it's not just lip service. It's not just saying like, and I think that was the danger. That's why I set up Sour Lemons, because I genuinely felt I was in a danger zone of being oversubscribed and asked to speak at so many things and looking at panels and being like, oh yeah, Sade's coming, you know? And almost it becoming like the safety thing. And I also think just purely calling it out, <laughs> as I am doing now. Um, but I choose to work in depth. So my model isn't about breadth of reach. I don't need to work with 300 young people a year. I work with 12. I tool them up. I give them everything that they need in order to go out. And then we support them to, to do the ripple effect. And I think that's also how you make the change. And you know, now I'm getting asked to give speeches and I'm sending my young leaders to give them instead because they're just as equipped, if not more equipped than I am because they're still young. I mean, I am 26, I'm 26. I know some of you are looking at me like, what is she talking about? But I just, I'm old at heart, I've got an old soul. Um, but you know, yeah, I mean, hilariously, some of them are actually my age, which is funny, but anyway. Um, it's putting people in positions of power. That's the only way you change it. We can't, you know, we can't change the fact that, well, I mean, hopefully we can, but currently, you know, the statistic I showed about the 7% of the population who are part of the educated, like, but it's just about broadening that out and making sure that everyone has access to those opportunities. So if we're in positions of power where we're hiring people or casting, it's making sure that we consciously are making an effort to diversify, not just based on one protected characteristics, and not just because someone has access issues or because someone is a person of colour. It's looking at the whole spectrum of it. And actually, socioeconomics is so much more important. So for, for Sour Lemons, it's about socioeconomics. It's not about race. Because race is one facet. And I found myself in meetings where people would be looking at a brochure for marketing a show and they're like, mm, it doesn't really look diverse though, does it? And they would be like, what does that mean? What, because there's not black kids on the front of it? Like, what does that mean? And so for me, socioeconomics is so much more important because it's what goes on underneath. And often when I go in and speak to young people, so this is also the power of speaking to young people, I mean young, young people. So I go into schools a lot and I talk to assemblies and I start by telling them one version of me. I'm an award-winning, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I tell them the other version, and I was kicked out of two secondary schools, and I did this, and I did that. And I share with them the power of narrative and how you can not only change your own narrative, but you can change the narrative for other people. And that, I think, is the power. I think someone like Alan Sugar maybe doesn't care about that. Although <laughs> 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 he makes a lot of money. <laughs> 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 <laughs>